So, hey, welcome to day four of the 12 days of Celtic mythology. What I'm doing is I'm telling a story over 12 days, and then I'm using that story to bounce off lots of new and exciting ideas about Celtic mythology. So we should catch up with where we are in the story so far. So there's a king called Khan, and he has a son called Art. And there's a woman called Bekova, and she has appeared from the other world. And she has a bit of a checkered history. She's been thrown out of the other world and sent to live with the mortals of Ireland. And her plan has been to marry young Art. Of course, Art knows nothing about this yet. But Con, whose wife had recently died, got to her first. He ordered Bekova to marry him, even though he knew she loved Art. You know, families, eh? But Bekova hadn't been straight with Khan. Um, what, for one thing, she told him that her name was Delvkive. So Bekova, alias Delvkive, also put a condition on the marriage to Khan. And the condition was that Art be banished from the kingdom for a year. And who can blame her? That's a pretty awkward situation. But during that year, the crops failed and the cattle got sick. And the Druids blamed Bekova. And they told Khan to get rid of her, but he refused. So they told him that he would need to find the son of a sinless couple and mingle his blood with the soil of Tara. Now I can see that the daily synopsis is going to get longer and longer. I might have to leave some things out. So if you want to get a better sense of uh, what's going on in the whole story, you'll find some links to me telling the whole thing in the YouTube description. And also there's, you know, there's, there's places where you can read it. And I put those in the description below the video. So let's get on with the story. So Art's year of exile ended. And he returned to Ireland. So once again, Khan left him to watch over the kingdom while he made his way to the beach at Howth. And he found the coracle hidden in the rocks where he and Bekova had left it. And he stepped into it. And without oar or sail, it carried Khan off into the deep in search of his sacrificial victim. Long and long he voyaged with only the stars for his companions. The great creatures of the deep swirled about his boat and wild storms assailed him. And when he thought he would surely be drowned, the storm ceased and then he was becalmed for days and he made no headway at all. At last, though, he came to a beautiful island, and it was full of apple trees and wells flowing with wine. And around the wells were copses of hazels, heavy with their crop of nuts. Apple trees dropped their blossoms into the wells, and the bees hummed busily. Soon he saw a wondrous house, it was thatched with blue and yellow and white wings of birds. It had a door of crystal set on doorposts of bronze. He was made welcome by the king and the beautiful queen who lived there. They sat upon thrones of crystal with their son, Shagda, between them. Well, we can all guess what Khan is thinking, but you'll have to wait until tomorrow to hear what happens next. Either that or you can follow those links in the description and read or listen to the story. So these sessions are only partly about telling the story. They're as much about following all the paths that branch off from the story so that we can look at different corners of Celtic mythology. So I've already mentioned that this story, although it's probably much older, is a 
product of the time in which it was written down to some extent, a time when the Irish scribes were both keen to record the stories of their native culture, and yet when they were also still grappling with ways to reconcile the differences in the worldview and cosmology between their native myths and Christian dogma. So my approach is that rather than get really angry about Christian scribes messing with the mythology, which they did, it's important to remember that it was also their mythology. And it's an interesting exercise to look at some of the ideas they came up with. And this idea of the sinless couple is worth considering. So there are a few things feeding this idea. Saint Augustine of Hippo introduced the idea of sinless marriage way back in the fourth century. His idea was that the highest ideal would be that couples didn't have sex at all. Their marriages were just for companionship and mutual support, but completely celibate. So failing that, and this is an idea that has kind of echoed down through the centuries in Christianity, Failing that, the next best thing was only having sex once in a while without enjoying it, obviously, in order to conceive children. So the son of a sinless couple in this context suggests that the couple perhaps only had sex once, and that was in order to conceive their son. And this makes him the son of a sinless couple. But there's another thread at work here. Most people understand the Christian heaven to be a paradise where God and the angels dwell. And if you behave yourself, it's also where you go when you die, right? Now, I know the book of Revelations and certain prophecies suggest slightly more complex systems of things involving the judgment day and purgatory and so on. <clears throat> but the general idea that most of us live with is that there's only one Christian other world, if you like, which is heaven. And it serves both the purpose of the home of God and the angels and the place you go when you die. We can't quite know what pre-Christian Celtic cultures thought about the other world or the afterlife. These ideas may have been diverse in different places because there were Celtic people spread over a wide area and they may have changed over time. However, it feels like there may have been different other worlds with different meanings and functions. And there's very little evidence that these places were where you went when you died. They were inhabited by immortal races, perhaps, or at least by magical races. You might call them gods. And these people would, or these gods, would have powers that are greater than those of humans. At the same time, the classical writers suggest that the Celts of Gaul, at least, believed in some form of transmigration of the soul into another body. That means you kind of, when you die, you go into another body, but you don't necessarily go through infancy. You aren't born and a baby or a, a baby animal or whatever. You, you, just, you just kind of go into another body. Or it could have been something more like reincarnation, but probably without the heavy karma stuff that we find, say, in Hindu religion. So I've got a couple of things to share with you. This is from uh, Julius Caesar. Um, we can always take him with a grain of salt, but he seems to be falling in step with other classical writers here. He says that they, that is the Druids, wish to inculcate this as one of their leading tenets. That means to emphasize it, that souls do not become extinct, but pass after death from one body to another. And they think that men by this tenet are in a great degree excited to valor, the fear of death being disregarded. So this was a real hang up for Caesar that the Celtic warriors that his men were up against fought kind of almost irrationally from the Roman point of view. And he attributed this to the Druids telling them, well, it doesn't really matter because if you get killed, you'll just be right back. And this is um, from Pomponius Mela, another classical writer. 
<clears throat> and one of their doctrines has become commonly known to the populace so that warriors might fight more bravely, that the spirit is eternal and another wife, life awaits the spirits of the dead. Another life, not another wife, but probably another wife too, hey. So there's no evidence that they believed that you went to some kind of other world first, where you waited for that change to happen. This is you know, kind of like what some spiritualists believe today. There's no evidence for that belief. <clears throat> Now, the Irish story of Tuan McCarroll, which is quite an old story, is another um, instance of something like this happening. So in this story, um, Tuan has become old and decrepit, and he lies down for a sleep, and this happens. At last, I, was, I became decrepit, and I could no longer travel. I dwelt in cliffs and waste places, and certain caves were special to me. One night as I slept, I saw myself pass into the shape of a stag. I was in it after that. In other words, I was in that shape. I was young and in good spirits. I was the leader of a herd and used to make the circuit of Ireland in the midst of a great herd of stags. And equally, the Welsh bards, especially when they wrote in the voice of Taliesin, spoke of having been in many, many forms. So this is a bit long, but we'll just enjoy it. Taliesin is describing his many existences. And he says, a second time my shape shifted and I was a blue salmon, a hound and a stag, a roebuck on the mountain, a clod and a spade and an ax in the hand, an auger gripped in tongs for a year and a half, a speckled white cockerel for the hens in Aden, a stallion at stud, a ramping bull, a sheaf stacked for milling, meal ground for farmers. I was grain in a sieve, grain that grew on the hill. I am harvested, stored, sent off to the kiln and scattered by hand, ready for roasting. Well, it's amazing poetry. It's not quite clear whether this is describing many separate lives or maybe something like transcendence that he's having or has experiences where he experiences all this at once. And in this next little short quote, Tyesson mixes biblical and Welsh mythological Im imagery and the whole poem, this is just a little snippet, but the whole poem kind of does this. And apparently he's not afraid of being accused of heresy. He says, I was atop the cross of the merciful son of God. I was three times in the prison of Arianrod. Wow. Whatever of it, we can see that the beliefs are kind of diverse and there's a, a need to try and somehow integrate Christianity and native beliefs. So as the centuries of Christianity rolled past, we don't quite know how all those changes happened. Um, the beliefs of the remaining cultures in Britain and Ireland sorted it out as best they could. We can't know because there's still a long gap before anything gets written down. So let's go back to the question of sex and sin. Many, many Celtic stories, in spite of being written down by Christian scribes, are really relaxed and frank and matter of fact about people having sex without being married. Equally, there are all kinds of references to this which are judgmental, so it's quite mixed, you know, sometimes it's one and sometimes it's the other. And you can be pretty sure that some scribe has added his opinion to the mix when there's that bit of judgment. Of course, the bards and storytellers were Christians and they must have been doing, you know, something similar so it's not just the scribes who wrote it down. The, the storytellers were Christianized for centuries and they must have censored or altered the tone of things to suit the times. It's just that we have no record of it. Nevertheless, we find Irish texts from different centuries where we can really sense the storytellers are struggling with this. There's a lot of tension and also some very awkward splices 
where attempts are being made to fit everything together. And this idea of sacrificing the son of a sinless couple is just one. So generally in Christian cosmology, the angels are seen as kind of sexless, right? They, they don't engage in sexual intercourse. They're perhaps don't really have a specific gender. So one tendency was to portray the inhabitants of Celtic other worlds in a similar way, not as genderless, but as not having sex. So our friend Khan had another son called Conla. And Conla isn't in our story, but he has his own story, The Adventures of Conla. And this, this story goes that Conla was also loved by a fairy woman. And she appeared to Conla several times right under Con's nose, but only Conla could see her. And Con and his druids could hear her speaking to Conla and the druids tried to drive her away to prevent her from luring Conla away into the other world. And the stories give this unnamed immortal woman some interesting lines. So at one point she tells Conla that he will be young and beautiful until the day of judgment. <laughs> so who knew that fairy women believed in that? <laughs> and in another scene, Con's druid is chanting away, trying to keep Conla from being taken. You know, he's chanting spells. And the woman says, put not your faith in druids for on the day of judgment, their false laws and spells shall have no power. So the scribes are kind of putting Christian rhetoric into the mouth of the fairy woman. It's really bizarre. In the end, Conla does go away with the woman to live in the other world. After that, his brother Art is sometimes called Art Einver, I think it's probably pronounced, which means Art alone. So we'll come back to Conla in a moment. I mentioned the story of Teg, son of Kien, in day two. During their adventures, Teg and his men find themselves on an otherworldly island. And through the description of this island, we can really see the 15th century storytellers. So Teg, son of Kian, is about the same period as Art, um, The Adventures of Art, our story. So we can see these storytellers struggling to reconcile native ideas about the other world with Christian ones. And they come up with some pretty novel solutions. So let's take a look. In this part of the story, Teg meets a series of women uh, and each one explains things that he sees in this otherworldly place they're sort of like tour guides so here Teg asks about a fortress he sees on a hill tell me what that royal fortress is atop the hill which is surrounded by a wall of white marble that is the fort of the royal line replied the lady what line is that asked Teg the line of Ireland's kings from Heremon, son of Mill, to Con of the Hundred Battles, who was the last to enter it. So I should just add that this story is set in a much later time than Con's time, than our story. But already we see that this other world might be a paradise for the afterlife, not just, it's just not the Christian heaven. So Khan asks the next woman about another fortress and she sends him to speak to a beautiful young couple who are sitting near this fortress. And this woman tells Teg her name. My name is Veniusa. I am the daughter of Adam. Four sisters we are here in the four mysterious countries which the former woman told you about. Our names are Veniusa, Letiusa, Aliusa, and Eliusa. Because of our mother's great guilt, that's Eve, of course, we must not live together. Yet since we are pure virgins dedicated to God, we are allowed to dwell separately in these beautiful houses. Who's the good looking lad beside you? asked Teg. Let him tell you himself, she said, for his speech is as eloquent as any. Now this 
was the appearance of the youth. He held in his hand a fragrant golden colored apple. He would eat a third of it, and yet it never diminished in size, no matter how much he consumed. So a magical apple. This fruit was the sole food of the couple, and because of it, they did not age. I am the son of Khan of the Hundred Battles, said the young man. Are you Khanla? Teg asked. Indeed I am, and it was this beautiful and charming woman who brought me here. I believe you, said Teg, for I have heard the story. I felt true love for him, said the girl, and so I called him to live here with me. We lived together, gazing and contemplating on one another without committing any sin of the flesh. Well, said Teg, that is both beautiful and comical at the same time. Can you tell me who lives in that grand fortress surrounded by a rampart of silver which stands over there? No one lives there, replied the girl. What is the meaning of that? asked Teg. It awaits the kings who have yet to rule Ireland. And I think that you shall be among the first to enter it, she said. Why should that be? Because it will be a house for the kings who confess Christ, which we keep in readiness, and you, dearest Teg, shall have a place there. So you probably didn't see that coming. I think you can see what I mean, that the storytellers are going through contortions at times, trying to integrate changing ideas about other worlds and the afterlife with existing native ones. So in this case, there are actually building works going on in the Irish other world to accommodate the Christian dead, like in their own houses. Meanwhile, Conla's so-called fairy woman is now identified as the daughter of Adam. Yeah, think about that. And they are living the celibate life and munching on apples. So if you're interested in reading Teg, son of Kian, the story uh, and the story about Conla and the other woman, uh, the fairy woman, and a couple of other stories you can buy. This wee book from me, it's called Teg, Son of Kian. And there's a link in the live chat if you want to buy it. And tomorrow we'll find out whether Khan manages to take the sinless laddie back to Ireland with him in order to end the famine. So I'll see you tomorrow.